okay, I believe we have quorum, so uh, if uh, uh, members of council could take their seats. Uh, good morning and welcome to the 6th of March uh, FEDCO meeting. Bienvenue à la réunion de FEDCO pour le 6 mars 2018. If anyone would like to speak to items that are on the agenda, could you please uh, sign up uh, under the screen? We'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, simultaneous interpretation is available as well. Il y a de l'interprétation, uh, traduction pour uh, nos amis en français ou en anglais. Uh, declaration of interest from previous meetings, Councillor Chernyshenko. Yes, thank you. I, Councillor David Chernyshenko, was absent during the Finance and Economic uh, Development Committee meeting of Tuesday, the 6th, February 2018, where at the above noted item, sorry, I should have read that to start with, the additional item, Twin Elm Rugby Park, um, where at this above noted item was added to the meeting agenda for the committee's consideration. Because I could not make the following declaration at that time, I hereby declare for the record a potential indirect pecuniary interest on FEDCO agenda. 34 February 6, 2018, additional item, Twin Elm Rugby Park. Thank you. Are there any other conflicts of interest? Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Sam uh, Barada, who is Ottawa's new Regulatory Monitor and Compliance Officer. If he could stand there. Mr. Barada, thank you very much. Congratulations. I know you're spending some time working uh, and meeting with the Rail Office uh, staff. We appreciate you accepting our offer. Bienvenue. Thank you. Uh, confirmation of minutes uh, for the 6th of February, le 6 février 2018. Carried. Uh, I'm just going to go through the consent agenda. Presentations, Councillor El Shantiri uh, has a motion on the presentation, but we have uh, public delegations for other items, so we'll hear the, the motions uh, first from you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Therefore, be it resolved that Finance Economic Development Committee Wave Section 83, Subsection 4A of the Procedure Bylaw to receive a presentation from staff with respect to the Confederation Line and dispense with the requirement of staff to provide separate written report on this uh, presentation. So waiving the rules, carried. On the motion as presented, carried. And second motion, please. Moved by myself, therefore, be it resolved that Finance Economic Development Committee waive Section 83, Subsection 4 of the Procedure Bylaw to receive a presentation from staff with respect to the Confederation line and dispense with the requirement of staff to provide separate written report on this presentation. Therefore, be it resolved that be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee approve the addition of response <coughs> to inquiries number TTC 03-18 and OCC 03-18, both referencing the staff presentation on Confederation line update to the agenda for committee's meeting today pursuant to subsection 89.3 of the procedures bylaw been bylaw number 2016-377 so that the responses Two inquiries may be listed on the agenda <coughs> for the city council meeting on March 28th. 2018. Okay, suspension carried, the motion carried. So we'll come back to that. Item two, we'll, uh, we have a motion from Councillor El Shantiri, update from Sports Commissioner on major events. So we'll do the motion now and we'll come back to it because we have public delegations later in the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and myself, that therefore be it resolved that Finance and Economic Development Committee waive Section 83. Four of procedures by law to receive a presentation from the sports commissioner with respect to major events and dispense with the requirement of staff to provide a separate written report on this presentation. Uh, on suspension, carried. Okay. On the motion, carried. Um, we're going to, uh, with co uh, committee's concurrence, ask uh, uh, Councillor Middick, who is uh, battling the flu and came in for this, to uh, put his item. Uh, first after the public delegation. Is that agreeable? Yes. Thank you. Uh, item three, Office of the City Clerk and Solicitor, Bureau of the FEA, Comprehensive Legal Services Report for the period July 1st to December 31st, le 1er juillet jusqu'à le 31 décembre 2017. Received. Uh, Corporate Services Department, uh, we have a presentation on reserves, uh, review, review des reserves, so we'll come back to that. 
Uh, item five, we have a presentation on disposition of 2017 tax and rate supported operating surplus deficit, unless people have any questions on that. This one was pretty straightforward. On item five, carried. Yeah. Uh, item six, statement of remuneration and benefits and expenses paid to members of council and council appointees. Uh, they set out as avantages sociales, etc., pour des membres du conseil. Received. A delegation of authority, acquisition and sale of land and property, October 1st, 2017 to December 31st, 2017. Delegation de pouvoir, acquisition et vente de terrain et des propriétaires de October, le 1er octobre 2017 jusqu'au 31 décembre 2017. Received. Uh, we have a delegation for, uh, two delegations for 2720 Richmond Road, option to repurchase parcel. We'll come back to that. Uh, planning, infrastructure, and economic development, uh, Ottawa, uh, McDonald, Cartier Airport. We have uh, two delegations to that, so we'll come back to that. So the first items that we have uh, with members of the public is item number eight, which is 2720 Richmond Road, option to repurchase a parcel, parcel A portion of land owned in, by Cooperative Multiservice Francophone de l'Est, CMFO, to the le, le Conseil des Écoles uh, Publiques de l'Est de l'Ontario and disposal of portion B, portion of the city-owned land to um, CEPEO. So we have uh, Mr. Jeffrey Sharp uh, to come forward, uh, followed by Mr. Al Spires. And uh, gentlemen, you have uh, five minutes and uh, the seat is right to uh, my right here. What's that? Yeah, right uh, to the right there. Thank you. So if you just push the button, Mr. Sharp, uh, you have the floor for five minutes. Uh, should be the black one. Is that all right? There yes. we go. <coughs> We're here today about an item that uh, was first brought to the attention of the 26th Council which, uh, after the successful lobbying effort of the uh, proponents of this project, uh, managed to acquire a considerable sum of monies from Council <coughs> regarding the acquisition of a surplus property put up by the Audible Carlton District School Board. <coughs> the property sold for $3,940,000, which is not uh, a small sum of money, uh, which was debentured in 29, uh, this information was made available by the uh, city treasurer, thank you very much, for um, a very large sum of money which was included in the debenture for $100 million, which was issued in uh, 29, bearing an interest rate of 4.23%, which I understand matures next year. Uh, a large sum of money and a successful effort on the part of the proponents, which did not involve any wide debate in either Britannia Heights, where the school happens to be located, the former school property, <coughs> let, alone, let alone a wide debate that would have been put forward through the, uh, the city. In fact, um, what we have here is a situation where the property was acquired not because of any long-term plan by council, but rather because of the success of the proponents to advance a complex proposal, which quite frankly, if the dragons had been on council, I think that they would have uh, passed it over. And where we are today, I think demonstrates clearly that what we have here is sort of reverse alchemy. We have money given for slag. And I don't think that's too harsh a description of the property today. The property which is still owned completely by the corporation, Section B, which contains a uh, building known as the Annex, is a shambles, as was recorded by CBOT when they sent a crew out last year to show the interior of the building, which had been gutted, uh, evidence of fires, and so on, which... Uh, I think speaks for itself, negligence on the part of the corporation, which didn't even take care of the remaining piece of property that the corporation still owns. We're now at a situation where staff are recommending that council and first of all committee waive the city's right to repurchase the northern part of the property for the sum of $1. 
Council and First Committee, I think you have to realize this. We're not talking about a small sum of money. We're talking about $3,940,000 times 423%, a 10-year maturity date, which even without a calculator comes to $5,666,000 plus. I can't be more precise than that because I don't know the actual maturity date. We are now being told by staff through committee and in council that you should waive your right and that you in effect should do something that I can't find any evidence of other than to repeat what the city treasurer told me in answer to three questions. In the past 17 years, because this would have been late last autumn, how much money has passed from the corporation to any recognized board of education within the authority of Greater Ottawa for one, the acquisition of land, the refurbishment of a building, or the construction of a new facility? And the city treasurer's response, which was very prompt, was nothing. Now, committee, you as members of the city council of Ottawa, you have your responsibilities, just as every municipality in the province has responsibilities. It does not include subsidizing school boards. And in effect, if you take the advice of staff in regard to this particular matter, you are saying that a property that has acquired an interest rate, which has built to a large sum of money, can in effect be transferred to a school board that demonstrated absolutely no interest in acquiring the property when the Ottawa Cog District School Board first declared the property to be surplus. Is this right? Is this going to One set minute. a precedent? Are we going to have other school boards in the district come in? In fact, I've asked the question of the city solicitor's office, which was not answered. <laughs> How many cities in the province of Ontario have already made contributions for any of those things that I asked the city treasurer about and I haven't been given an answer? I would ask you, in the name of good common sense, to maintain the integrity of the agreement, the right to repurchase the property, and to open a true public debate about what not just residents of Britannia Heights, where the school is located, want, but what do the ratepayers of Ottawa want? Stand by the agreement, and I have to say it with respect to staff, this is the second time that the Council of 2010 has been presented with a written material regarding this. Hey, Mr. That, uh, your time is up if you want to wrap up. The last one was in March of 2015 when you were asked to give up your rights in case the proponents actually went to a financial institution to open a line of credit of 1,600,000. Okay, thank you very much. Do Does anyone right have thing. any questions for Mr. Sharp? Thank you. Uh, next is Mr. Uh, Al Spires. Uh, just push the button, Mr. Spires. And uh, Mr. Spires, are you representing an organization or yourself? Oh. I'm sorry, sir? Are you representing an organization or yourself? Uh, I'm, I'm, the, uh, the people that I, I'm here on behalf of, uh, sir, are uh, 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 43 uh, ratepayers who uh, signed a letter uh, of a few weeks ago that was uh, sent uh, to uh, City Treasurer, uh, Ms. Simulok. Thank you. Okay, so. You have five minutes. Mr. Chair, does everyone have a copy of the, uh, of my, of my talk? Yep. In case, in case I follow Billy Graham home to his new address before I finish, at least you'll have an idea of what I'm about to say. Uh, dear Mr. Chair and members of FEDCO, it is deeply regrettable that the November 1st, 2016 letter of intent mentioned on page four of today's report and signed by the CMFO and the CEPEO could not be made available in time for this meeting. This letter may have indicated the terms and conditions under which the CMFO would sell parcel A of the Grand School site for $1 to the French School Board. As you may recall, the city sold parcel A to the CMFO for $1 on April 17, 2015. 
The letter of intent thus stands as pivotal and as foundational to a fuller understanding of what is the reasoning, the logic, the purpose behind today's report to the FEDCO. What then are some of the other implications not mentioned in today's report before you? First, may I again turn your attention to page four of today's report, third paragraph from the top, which states, quote, in the event that CMFO did not proceed with the development of the property in accordance with her final business plan, after the closing date, the city would have the option to repurchase the property for the purchase price less the amount of the city's grant. However, what is not mentioned in this paragraph, <coughs> excuse me, is the actual closing date of April 17, 2015, and the other conditions attached to that closing date. Please turn your attention to the overhead screen. Let's see if I can get, uh, here we go. which is the report to the FEDCO of March 3rd, 2015, three years ago today, when I also appeared before this body. Please turn to page four of this report, and two-thirds down the page, we find almost the same wording that you find in today's report. Be right here, and also on your hard copy that I left, uh, that I left with you. Regarding the city's option to repurchase a subject property, but with the added words that the city retains the right to do so in the case the CMFO, quotes, attempts to sell, lease, or otherwise dispose of the property within 10 years from the date of sale. And the date of sale is April 17, 2015, less than three years ago, and more than seven years left, uh, uh, left on this binding legal agreement struck between the city and the CMFO. This agreement was adopted by this FEDCO body three years ago on March the 3rd, 2015, and by council on March the 11th of that year. Please also look at page nine of the same report. So I can bring this up. And here we have, again, under, under item two, under item two, we have the same wording again. So there's no ambiguity here. This agreement was adopted, but okay, I, I read that. Please look at page nine, uh, March 3rd report at the FEDCO, where it is again clearly articulated what the FEDCO and council adopted by way of staff recommendation regarding the repurchase of parcel A of the Grand School site. The question then before us is why was this part of the agreement not mentioned in today's report? Why was this material information not made available in today's report to the FEDCO? By waiving the city's option to repurchase parcel A means the city staff is asking you, members of the FEDCO and council, to abrogate, to nullify, to rescind, to overturn, and otherwise get out from under a current legally binding agreement that has more than seven years to go before its expiry. But the only legal option open to the cities to take back the entire grant school project. Second, by adopting the city staff's recommendation regarding the waiving of the city's right to repurchase parcel A, the city may also be inviting judicial scrutiny. Please look at the one page attachment to the document handed out earlier with the title Education Act. 30 seconds. Wherein is articulated the French Public School Board's requirement to submit for approval and to obtain ministerial approval to proceed with this multi use facility. Is that mentioned in the November 1st, 2016 letter of intent? Third, should the FEDCO now adapt the staff recommendation to waive the repurchase option, you may well have found the city running afoul of the Municipal Act, Section 196, that addresses the issue of what is commonly known as municipal bonusing which specifically addresses the issue of selling any property of the municipality at below fair market value. If Not only is parcel B worth more than two. Mr. Spires, if you could wrap up, you're uh, over time now. Sir, the text is in front of you, got one paragraph left. One okay. paragraph, okay. Okay, page four. As the, is worth, not only is parcel B worth more than two million today, but parcel A is worth vastly more than the one dollar the French board proposes to pay for it. As the entire grant school stands today, it is more likely worth in the neighborhood of seven million. And with the two million the French board is willing to pay would mean the French school board would become a lucky recipient of approximately five million dollars of municipal taxpayers paid for property. A nice free gift for an already tax-funded public school board. Thank you, sir. 
Okay, are there any questions for Mr. Spires? No? Okay, thank you. Uh, on item eight, uh, as presented, carried? Yes. Carried. All right, the next item we have delegations for is uh, Planning Infrastructure and Economic Development, Direction General de Planification de l'Infrastructure de Development Economique, uh, Ottawa McDonald Cartier International Airport Authority application for an exemption bylaw to the Retail Business Holidays Act. We have Mr. Joel Takach, VP Business Development and Marketing for the airport. And uh, if you'd like to take a, a seat on uh, the first seat there. And followed by uh, Mr. Sean McKenney, President, Labor and District uh, Labor Council. President, I guess it's Ottawa and District Labor Council. Thank you. Mayor Watson, councillors, city staff, and members of the public. Good morning, bonjour. My name is Joel Takach, and I serve the Ottawa International Airport Authority in the role of Vice President of Business Development and Marketing. Further to our written submission, Requesting an exemption by law to the Retail Business Holidays Act, we appreciate this opportunity to briefly speak to this matter. Given that, to my knowledge, every major airport in North America, and quite possibly the world, has all passenger retail services open during business holidays, we were surprised to learn that YOW could be in violation of the Retail Business Holidays Act. I hope we agree that correcting this situation falls into the no-brainer category, and that the airport will be granted the bylaws recommended by staff. Nonetheless, we don't want to make an assumption, so I'll take two minutes to summarize our case. YOW is open 24-7, 365, and we served last year over 4.8 million travelers. On average, that's over 13,000 travelers every day. On some stat holidays, like Thanksgiving, we're above the average, and on other stat holidays, like Christmas, we're only slightly below. The airport itself has been hosting visitors since the arrival of Lindbergh in 1927 and is a key player in the maintenance of the development of the region's year-round tourism industry. In fact, many see YOW as an attraction in itself for not only aviation, but artistic, historical, and cultural displays as well. In support of the needs of visitors as well as airport employees, the terminal offers a mix of food and retail outlets. Having concessions closed during holidays would not only be punitive to travelers, airport workers, but also an economic detriment to the community. Our concession operators, of which some of them are with me today, are highly familiar with the common day of rest principle which is enshrined in the RBHA legislation. That's why they ensure that their staff have the opportunity to refuse statutory holiday shifts to which employees are entitled by law. Based on the incentives offered, positive work culture in the airport itself, collective agreements, as well as overall employee attitudes, we have no major issues maintaining our high service levels that are recognized as being amongst the best in North America. So thank you for your time and attention to this matter. On behalf of the over 10,000 employees who are dependent on the successful operation of YOW, earning over $600 million in annual labor, in labor income, generating over 100 million in tax revenue, we respectfully request your favorable support of the motion that FEDCO recommend that Council enact a bylaw to exempt the airport passenger terminal from stores from closing uh, per the requirements of the Retail Business Holiday Act. Thank you, Missy. We have a question from Councillor Harder. I was just wondering um, if uh, we know uh, where this came from or who uh, started this and how how deep they had to dig for something that uh, clearly is borders on insanity from my perspective. My understanding, it was brought to my attention through my staff that's responsible for the, the retail program within the airport. It was brought to my colleague's attention by one retailer uh, who had one employee who I understand has legal aspirations. One employee who what, sorry? Uh, who I understand has legal aspirations. Oh, well. I'm happy to support this. Thank you. Uh, because, first of all, I'd, it never even occurred to me that uh, we would put our, our international airport at such a disadvantage and uh, at your busiest times, obviously, and therefore your, your clients uh, that you know, provide services for the traveling public. I don't know about the rest of you on the table, but I, I'm, 
actually shocked that uh, we're even having this conversation. Agreed. Thank you, Thank you Councilor Harder. Thanks, Councillor Aguilar, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question for legal. D do we actually have a prohibition against the businesses being open in the airport? Uh, no, we do not, uh, Mr. Chair. It's uh, the Retail Business Holidays Act. So is an exemption even necessary? I mean, happy to give it, but it's just more paper. Do we need it? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it would be required in this instance. Okay. Councillor Chernyshenko, please. Yes, thank you. I'm ashamed to say, but I've been to a lot of airports in my time, and uh, the, uh, I've never once encountered one where, sorry, we're closed because it's a holiday. I've um, been to downtowns in a lot of cities and, <laughs> and other countries where I've run into that, but never once at an airport, and I can't imagine that. Um, so I would be uh, very pleased to, uh, to support this exemption. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Our next uh, presenter is Sean McKenney, President of Ottawa District Labour Council. Welcome, uh, Mr. McKenney. <clears throat> and congratulations on uh, re election. Thank you. <clears throat> Boy, I'm sure, <clears throat> sure looking forward to the success of my presentation this morning. Um, you know, look, um, I was accused of not having a, a brain by one of the councillors of being insane. So, um, good morning. The Ottawa District Labour Council, for those not aware, represents over 90 union locals and has a combined membership of over 50,000 working men and women in the city of Ottawa. We're strongly opposed to the application submitted by the Ottawa McDonald Cartier Airport Authority for an exemption bylaw to the Retail Business Holidays Act. But at the same time, it's frustrating to read <clears throat> in the media that the applicant has admittedly contravened or broken the law repeatedly for over 20 years, claiming an ignorance of that law with a maximum fine of $50,000 for each business within the RBHA in nine stats a year. Fitting it would be if the airport authority made a sizable donation to an Ottawa charity for that ignorance. Just over a year ago, I appeared in front of you suggesting in addition to all that was wrong with the Glebe BIA application, the application would be start of numerous other applications. The Fed co-chair publicly scoffed at the suggestion at the time, yet here we are just 13 months from those comments and we're at the second. Equally frustrating is the lack of attention given the intent of the Retail Business Holiday Act as it pertains to statute of holidays and tourism. Um, designation to suggest that a few paintings on a wall of our airport uh, and or the odd random sculpture placed strategically within the squalls falls within the meaning of a tourist attraction is mind-boggling. Likewise, to argue that the Spirit of St. Louis landed in a field on land that is now or near the airport uh, back in July of 1927 and that this falls within the parameters or intent of the exemption clause under the Retail Business Holidays Act is a stretch to say the least. I'll remind committee that the act is clear and that even if all the criteria is met, you're under absolutely no obligation to approve the application. I've stated it before and I'll say it again. What kind of city do we want? Many of you often speak about quality of life for residents, for those who live here and those with families. That mom or dad, sister or brother might now have to work on nine extra days, including Christmas, and we have no other place that can open on Christmas in the city that exists primarily so families can find the time in this incredibly busy world to spend together is wrong and quite frankly it's sad. I've also stated that to suggest the worker will have the option, the option of working on that stat holiday is equally as nonsensical. It's not reality, that's a fact. Equally so are those who suggest the employer will have the opportunity to earn more money if working on the holiday, if the employer paid the employee a fair wage, a good wage to begin with, there would be no need to work on a holiday. Our airport, as wonderful and spectacular to some as it may be, is not a tourist destination nor a tourist attraction. People don't come to our city to see our airport. We're not just talking about six days any longer, we're talking about nine, including Christmas, including Good Friday as well. 
uh, there's a record number of communities across this province to council uh, that are starting to grant these applications at record speed. And there's no doubt, absolutely no doubt, perhaps not in the lives of everybody in this room, but for sure uh, with our children or with our grandchildren that we will not see statutory holidays again. And the other piece is, and not that it's gonna make a big difference to a lot of uh, sitting around the table, but it's, it's, it's in our view, this is an election I issue and the position that each of you take uh, around staff holidays uh, and that the fact that our whole of the city as some around the table have suggested should be open on stat holidays uh, all the time. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions? No, thank you very much. Um, on the issue, carried. Uh, our next item is item two, update from sports commissioner of major events. I want to uh, point out uh, Michael Crockett, president of auto tourism is here and uh, thank you uh, very much for being here. Uh, as well as Daryl Cox, who's been uh, instrumental in uh, working with Councillor Minnick and attracting a lot of events. And uh, Councillor Minnick, I know you're a little under the weather, so we appreciate you yeah, uh, coming you. in at this time. And Thank I you, believe man. we have a PowerPoint presentation as well. Uh oh, is it working? <coughs> Bear with me. Good morning, colleagues and Mayor. Uh, thank you for the opportunity this morning to offer an update on our team's ongoing efforts to attract major sporting and culture ev uh, events to Ottawa. While the Ottawa 2017 team, 2017 team was very busy offering a series of impressive events that filled our hotels, restaurants, shops throughout the year, the team at Ottawa Tourism was hard at work attracting major events that will help our city keep up the momentum. I'd like to start by doing a bit of a recap of the fantastic sporting events that really contributed to boosting our city and our local econ economy in 2017. The 2017 Canadian National Skating Championships filled the arena at TD Place with figure skating enthusiasts in January, followed by a full house for the Davis Cup in February, and in what was the event's best attendance ever. OSEG was thrilled with the success of both these events and is hoping to bring them back in the future. In March, we hosted an exciting Red Bull crashed ice competition <coughs> Pardon me. over the Rideau Canal locks between Parliament and the historic Chateau Laurier. Crashed ice, the, the, the crashed ice final event of the season attracted approximately 200,000 people with all, who all braved the cold for the great event with 31% being from out of town. In the summer, we hosted the Canadian Triathlon Championships, the Global Relay Road National Cycling Championships, the Canadian Canoe Kayak White Water Championships, the Canadian Pacific Women's Open at the Hunt Club with one of their best attendances ever, and the Canadian Track and Field Championships at the Terry Fox Athletic Facility. The Canadian Track and Field Championships were a great success and will once again take place in Ottawa this year, attracting approximately 2,000 athletes and spectators to Ottawa. We, keep the pace this fall, we, we kept the pace this fall with the Lansdowne Park hosting two of the largest sold out events ever seen in our city's history, the 105th Grey Cup and the NHL 100 Classic Outdoor Game. The Grey Cup and the Grey Cup Festival brought football fans from across the country to the nation's capital, and, the, and TD Place hosted one of the best Grey Cup games in recent history. Uh, I was there, the snow didn't uh, stop the game at all, it was great. The team at OSEG did an amazing job, and all the reviews called this year's edition of the Grey Cup and its festival a massive success for our city. It was a big boost for our local economy with the event generating approximately $100 million in economic activity. In early December, Ottawa hosted yet another successful curling championship as fans from across the country came to watch the Tim Hortons roar the rings at the Canadian Tire Centre. Ottawa fans were thrilled to see hometown hero Rachel Holman and her team win the Women's Championship and advance to represent Canada at the 2018 Winter Olympics in South Korea. We then capped off the year by hosting a very successful NHL 100 Classic on December 16th, marking the 100th anniversary of the very first NHL game, a historic 1917 match that took place in Ottawa between the Senators and the Habs. 
I want to congratulate the Ottawa 2017, Ottawa Tourism, OSEG, the Senators, and all city staff who work to enable these wonderful events that take place in our city. It's no small feat, but we pulled it, but we pulled it off, and Ottawa's reputation as a great city in which to host sporting events has only grown stronger as a result. Now as we try to maintain the great momentum created in 2017, I'm pleased to say that 2018 has started off with some good news. In January, we officially opened the House of Sport at the RA Centre, a new state-of-the-art facility that now has 25 important national sporting organizations and multi-sport organizations, MSOs, and more than 200 employees now working under the same roof. The House of Sport is 88% leased and demonstrating the success of this important initiative. They are able to share best practices and leverage their strength in order to grow their sport and organizational capacity. Our region is home to 46 NSOs and MSOs, which represent 60% of the sector in Canada. <clears throat> in May 2015, Ottawa Tourism and the University of Ottawa jointly published an economic impact study showing a real economic impact of $76 million to the Ottawa Gatineau region from NSOs and MSOs. That's why it's so important for us to keep organizations like this in Ottawa. In addition, I'm pleased to announce that Hockey Canada has recently signed to move into the House of Sport. This new home for NSOs and MSOs will be a great asset to maintain our competitive edge over other cities and it will assist the city and Ottawa tourism in winning bids for future <coughs> major <coughs> sporting events. <coughs> but the House of Sport is not our only strength. Bid more, win more, host more strategy, along with the $1.5 million in major events funding from the city, are key to attracting and supporting large-scale sporting events in Ottawa. Some of these major sporting events have already started for 2018. Last month we hosted Taekwondo Canada's National Championships at the EY Centre, as well as a very successful Ice Dragon Boat Festival at Dow's Lake. This is a growing sport with lots of potential in Ottawa. We also announced that 2018 International Volleyball Federation Nation Nations League would take place at TD Place in June, attracting more than 1,200 athletes, spectators, and their families to Ottawa. Ottawa Tourism has already secured 19 major events that will take place this year and next in our city. If we look out a bit further, another five high-caliber events have already been secured for 2020 to 2022. This includes the 2021 and 2022 Canadian Cross Country Championships, an event that is expected to bring 1,400 athletes and spectators to our city. Beyond that, Michael Crockett, Daryl Cox, and the rest of, of the team at Ottawa Tourism are always hard at work pursuing many other large-scale events. One of them, obviously, is the 2020 North American Indigenous Games, which would attract 5,000 athletes coaches and officials from across North America to Ottawa in the summer of 2020, as well as more than 40 million in economic activity. In addition to this significant boost to our tourism sector, these games would be a meaningful way for the city to engage in the country's reconciliation efforts and recognize the, the achievements of Indigenous youth. There are currently nine major events that Ottawa Tourism has bid, in, bid on for 2019 to 2021, covering badminton, trampoline, gymnastics, canoe, kayak, and soccer. Over and above these, there are 17 other large-scale events on Ottawa Tourism Radar. The team is carefully assessing whether or not it is feasible for Ottawa to host, and if our chances are winning are realistic. As a result of the increased revenue generated from the new hotel tax, I'm confident that we, will be, that we are giving Ottawa Tourism the means to attract many of these great events and keep the momentum going and our hotels and restaurants full. I want to offer a sincere thank you to Daryl Cox at Ottawa Tourism for his ongoing efforts and terrific work in identifying and securing these events, which help us grow our sports community and our local economy. Thank you for your time and thank you for the opportunity to take you through this exciting process. Thank you very much, Councillor. I think it, it's great to see them all in context uh, and together. What an uh, incredible year we had and, and really we're not letting up. So. Uh, Congratulations to you and uh, the team. Uh, are there any questions for Councillor Medic? No. So uh, we'll receive the report and thank you very much and uh, get well soon. Uh, <clears throat> uh, our next item is the Confederation Line update, mise à jour sur la ligne de la Confédération. 
Uh, we have a opening comments by our city manager, and then we'll follow up with a uh, full presentation by Mr. Manconi and uh, his colleagues, and uh, we'll then open it up um, for questions and uh, comments from members of council. So I think we, we have uh, the PowerPoint that will be up on the screen, and we'll just give them a minute to settle in. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of committee. Today is our um, promised uh, first monthly update to uh, FEDCO on the Confederation Line. The focus today is going to be on um, our status for our construction. We're going to lead off with that. And we're also going to be incorporating in the presentation the response to the several council inquiries that have been tabled with staff. We're going to be addressing um, those questions today. John Manconi, our General Manager of Transportation Services, will lead the presentation um, with Marion Similik, Rick O'Connor, Gary Craig, and Christopher Swale on uh, the questions around Stage 2. Our status right now is that discussions have commenced with RTG, um, and we are still in ongoing discussions with them with respect to the project agreement and moving forward on the issues that you're going to hear about today. John Manconi and Marion Similik are leading the city team and uh, are at the table uh, with the RTG executive group. I can say that this point in time, and based on the comprehensive advice I've received, I'm confident that the City of Ottawa uh, taxpayers will be protected from any cost due to the delay. And so now I'll turn it over to uh, John, who will lead off the presentation. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the Commission, members of Council, uh, there's four parts to the presentation. Uh, I'm going to start off with a construction update of the entire system for you. Um, then I'm going to move into Section 2, which is uh, with those categories that you see on the screen. It's a, a consolidation of all of the qu and questions and inquiries that have been raised through the various standing committees, the discussions with councillors, emails, and so forth. And, uh, and then finish off, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Swale to touch on lessons learned that we're applying to Stage 2, and then he's going to turn it back to me for a wrap-up, and we can move into questions. Success today is that you leave the room with all of your questions answered. We're here to, uh, to uh, give you all the information that you need, and, uh, and if we don't have that today, we'll certainly follow up with you. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to start off with a, a short video. This is a very brief video of your LRT vehicles. They're state-of-the-art vehicles. They, uh, each vehicle weighs 80 tons. Uh, there's 50 kilometers of wiring in every vehicle. That's to demonstrate the complexity and the, uh, how state-of-the-art these uh, uh, vehicles are. 85,000 screws and bolts to put it all together, all assembled locally in Ottawa and uh, they reach speeds of 100 kilometers an hour. They're the first type of LRT vehicles in the world that do that. That's very, very important for your expansion of stage two and stage three. <coughs> I'm just gonna start the video, it's brief. Is that 100 kilometers an hour? <laughs> what did you say? You said 100 kilometers an hour. No, that's not 100 kilometers an hour. <laughs> um, so uh, that is a uh, one-car vehicle train, and when you're in full service, we're going to have two of those coupled together, which will hold our 600 passengers, as we've talked about in the past. Uh, now I'm going to go uh, literally uh, from Blair all the way to Tunney's. I'm going to walk you through the station uh, and give you a status of where we are with uh, the construction, testing, and commissioning, and so forth. So this is Blair Station the east uh, terminus for now and uh, what you see there is a station that is nearing completion uh, like a house we're in that fit and finish stage where there's all the finishing work that needs to be done uh, so you see the ceiling that needs to have the final treatment applied to it uh, and then where you see the conduit in the pillars and the posts those are going to have finish uh, aluminum wrap around it and the wayfinding uh, signs go up and so forth uh, glass is up es elevators are up uh, escalators are up and uh, it is an active rail line uh, the east East end is in a more complete state than the West End stations because that is where our testing and commissioning is occurring. We're currently testing from uh, Blair uh, to uh, the maintenance and storage facility and then it's going to be stretched out to Ottawa U. 
servo station, uh, you can see the roof lines in terms of the finish, and then the centerpiece within that roof line it gets the, uh, the remaining treatment. Glass is up to protect the, uh, the uh, customers, and also you start to see the shape and the configuration of these beautiful stations. Um, I also want to show you in this deck the things that you do not see that's going on behind the scenes. Um, I know when I was speaking uh, with uh, one of the councillors, um, uh, Councillor Brockington, he was asking about, it looks like there isn't activity at all the stations. There are literally hundreds of rooms and vaults and things that are occurring out of sight that are very critical and important. And this control room, this is the communication-based train control system. This is the millions of meters of wiring and connections and electronic components that are done by the electricians and technicians that uh, are, being, are nearing completion in the East End. And uh, while you don't see the activity, there's hundreds of staff and technicians that are out there working. And these systems drive everything from the trains, the escalators, the elevators, the emergency uh, signage, the uh, next train announcements. Uh, sprinkler alarms, fire alarms, escalators, elevators, and so forth. So behind the scenes, there's a lot of activity going on in these critical rooms. Um, trains, you've seen uh, one train, two trains, and uh, we're ramping up the number of trains that are on the test track, and we're, uh, that's all by design. As you go through the testing and commissioning phase, you are going to start to see a gradual increase in the number of trains and the configurations of the trains that uh, will be going from uh, Blair to Ottawa U, and once the tunnel connection is completed, all the way out to Tunney's, and that's an incremental wrap, uh, ramp up of our trains. Uh, this is Saint Laurent Station, a different configuration. Uh, it's very good for the mall. As we all know, it's integrated right in with that mall, and again, some people don't even know we're doing that activity. Uh, there's a lot of finishing work that is uh, nearing completion, but the trains are actively going through that station. There's two of them in tandem. Uh, and what you see on the, the fencing, that's there to protect the workers from the active rail line. It is an active, fully energized rail line, and work is going on concurrently with uh, the train testing and commissioning and the final construction. Tremblay, um, finishing works underway at Tremblay. This, we're very fortunate to have a multimodal station integrated with Via Rail. And uh, this is going to benefit all our visitors that come into our city in terms of being able to go east and west when they approach uh, into the city. Herdman is an elevated station. Uh, and, uh, you know, questions that I've often asked is what's with all the tarping and so forth? That's to protect the workers and the heating. That's an elevator shaft that is nearing completion. And then uh, also there is, uh, within the station itself, there is works that are completed that to some that are not familiar with construction practices seem unfinished. Those are escalators on both sides. They are done, they're completed, they've been turned on, and they're waiting final testing and commissioning. So uh, the reason they're wrapped up is to protect them from damage from construction activities and so forth. So there's a lot of things that are uh, already done. Uh, Lee Station, I show you this uh, for two reasons. The complexity uh, of the roof lines which make these stations so iconic and uh, uh, really will uh, uh, Test, uh, pass the test of time. Uh, they're complicated roof lines. They're, they're, set up, uh, they're established using lasers, and, and then they all the components get trucked in and they're assembled. Uh, the wood that you see on the stairs, that's protection over the uh, concrete. Those stairs are finished. So again, some people have said, well, you're pouring concrete on the steps and so forth. Most of those stairs are now completed. U Ottawa is in very good shape. There's uh, some great work underneath this platform, including an accessibility ramp. Uh, the connection to Ottawa University, and we will be very fortunate to have an integrated station with our Ottawa University campus. This is an important picture, the Toledo Station. It's your largest station. Uh, this will be a beehive of activity when it's fully uh, uh, commissioned in operation. Uh, think about where that was only months ago. RTG has done some really good work to get to where it is right now. And what's left, uh, that centerpiece, they already poured some concrete uh, last week and into this week. And then they will come in and lay the tracks down, the catenary for the electrification of the rail line. And that upper concourse will see glazing go up and artwork. And this will be your iconic station for downtown where there will be literally hundreds of thousands of people moving through there into the Rideau Center. The concourse connects you into the uh, platforms that take you uh, into the mall and over across. Parliament Station is in very good shape. Those are escalators, and then to the left is the uh, stairs, 
with some emergency exit signage for, uh, for employees. Parliament, uh, this is some f uh, final work that's underway. Uh, they're doing some fittings and so forth. And then Lion Station, you may ask, why am I showing you a station with tarps on it? Those tarps are a very good sign. To the right is a platform. It is now in its final finishing stages. So they're heating it to ensure that the finishes meet all the requirements of our specifications. Again, some things that you don't see. These are multi-million dollar fans. They're, uh, they're used throughout the system. And uh, you will not know that this is going on uh, right now as we speak throughout the entire uh, tunnel. These are critical pieces of infrastructure that uh, have tolerances that are very uh, delicate and they're critical. They uh, provide fresh air ventilation through the tunnel, but are also for extraction of smoke in the event of fire and so forth. So they are installed, they're tested, and they're commissioned, and they form part of the activities that are underway. Pimacy Station is our critical station uh, that will uh, drive a lot of the development in that area, and that one is moving along. Uh, as you can see, it's ready for the roofing material on top. And then within inside Pimacy Station, like the other ones, you see the finished escalators, the, uh, the concrete stairs that are protected, those steel posts, that those will receive glazing uh, shortly. Bayview, lots of activity there. I was by it this weekend, and this is your uh, multimodal uh, diesel line connects up with your electric line. It's an elevated station, and they were doing finishing work on the ceiling and some of the uh, preparatory work for uh, the uh, uh, finishes uh, for the conduits and so forth. And then Tunney's Pasture is a critical station on the west end. This is the one that I watch the most. Um, it is a, uh, um, an engineering marvel in terms of how it was constructed, but it is a very critical station because when it is uh, fully operational at peak, there'll be between 150 and 170 busloads coming in per hour during the peak, transferring into this station. So it is uh, being moved along quite nicely, and there's uh, some really great features that will form part of that. So opposite to what I showed you at the east end, this is a sample of a room that, that is not quite finished. This is controls elevators. And again, they're critical systems. Lots of work that needs to be done, uh, but there are hundreds of people, uh, technicians, electricians, and tradespeople that are working on these systems. And then track work. All of the track work, save and accept some lines in the uh, tunnel, which I'll get to in a moment, are completed but there's critical systems such as these crossover switches. Again, people have asked me, why have those tarps been there all winter long? Those are uh, switchover uh, tracks for when they get to the terminus and the trains do not turn around. They slide over to the other side of the track and then the operator uh, gets up and goes to the other end. So the trains have equal wear on both the track and on the rail uh, wheels themselves. This is inside the tunnel. And again, invisible to the public, but there's a lot of activity going on. To the right, you see the, uh, the track that has been fastened to those concrete uh, supports. There's the overhead catenary. They don't use wires in the tunnels. That's for your electrification of the train. And to the left, you see an employee. They're putting in the dowels to uh, fasten the, the, uh, the tracks. And over on both sides, this is where conduit critical infrastructure gets run through. This is the work that they're completing now, which will enable the uh, uh, tunnies to blare connection of the trains. And then this is your maintenance and storage facility. This one's an important picture in that it shows we have 25 of the 34 trains built. Uh, and again, I've had questions about, uh, we thought the maintenance and storage facility was completed. It is completed. The work you're seeing there now is part of stage two. It's the renovations that are occurring to prepare it for the stage two build out of the uh, rail line of the uh, trains, and Councillor Cloutier knows that one very well. He's been very supportive in helping us in terms of the community interactions with, uh, with our activities there. And this is a completed guideway. I wanted to show you that. That's track, crossovers. Those, that's the overhead catenary for both lines. Those are ballasts and weights to keep the tension on those lines ready. So there's a lot of components to what goes into building a railroad. Now, in terms of the questions and the issues, I want to start off with the four priorities that we've uh, always had front and center. The first one is RTG needs to meet the November 2nd date. We are, uh, that is their date that they've given us. We remind them of that every single day that we interact with them and uh, our focus is on that with them. We need to receive a safe, reliable, and world-class system. 
Uh, RTG needs to cover all the incremental costs resulting from their, their new RSA date. Remember that? That is their date contractually. They own that. And the interests of taxpayers, transit users, and all our residents are protected. Now, with respect to the project agreement you're going to see in the presentation, I have uh, included, with the help of our legal team, all of the, the clauses, if you want to reference them. It's posted online. It's been there for, uh, for a long time. If you need to see any of these clauses that I'm referring to, we can direct you there. We're going to hold RTG accountable for fully meeting the requirements of the, of the project agreement. We always have, and we will continue to that will our position. So there's no wavering on positions and, and waiving of uh, project agreement requirements. Uh, at the same time, we have a 30-year relationship with this consortium, and we need to, they know that we are fair and fair and professional, and that we need to think about the long-term relationship, uh, but that does not mean that we will uh, let our guard down and move away from what they are required and obligated and contractually required to provide us. And the P3 that you've signed, it's an award-winning P3. I can tell you, you've had national attention, international attention now on that P3, and it has been replicated over and over and it is the model for how to do P3s and uh, you have a very great contract and we will use the uh, elements within that to leverage our position and that PA serves as the basis for negotiations as we've noted in the past. Now with respect to the RSA date, I know that uh, you know that on November 24th they gave us a, an RSA date but it was conditional. And they use the words that are in those quotes, as such date may be extended due to delay events and variations. That was not acceptable to us, and we advised RTG immediately that that condition was not acceptable as per the PA. And this is the beginning of the references. I won't read all those out. They're there for your use. Um, and RTG gave us a schedule on December 7th that demonstrated that they could achieve that RSA date if all of the, de the delays, and I put delays in quotes, their interpretation of delays were mitigated. And I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, I had a, a couple of counselors ask me, well, what are some of the risk points, counselor, and, and I'm sure Rick will, will endorse this, is there's two key, uh, key words, uh, two key statements you want to be careful with, delay events and relief. Those are contractual terms, as you're going to see in my presentation, we have not given to RTG, and they know that. And those are words that, if we start to enter into discussions about that, can cause us to, uh, to get into some legal concerns. So uh, what we, I'll walk you through what occurred with the RSA timelines. So December 2016, if you go back to then, they, uh, they provided us and continually provided us a schedule that said they were going to achieve May 24th. Uh, and uh, from December 2016 right to May 2017, they continue to issue a work schedule that says they're going to achieve the May 24th date. Not only did it show that, that was their position and it, they continued to be their position. Uh, we, we monitored their uh, schedule as I've noted in the past and we started to see some slippage, month over month slippage, and we brought that to their attention. But despite that, they continued to say that they're, uh, they were going to achieve the May 24th date. Uh, and rather than sit and wait for November, uh, I brought to the city manager and he endorsed it 100% that I was going to commission an independent assessment team to come in and undertake a joint review, and this is key, a joint review with RTG to look at the, uh, how, what was the probability of being successful for them to achieve that May 24th uh, date. And that was in the absence of having a detailed schedule that showed how they were going to mitigate the that we were starting to observe. And those independent uh, assessment team, these are experts from North America that have built, designed, and implemented, and managed these complex systems. So in, we complete that assessment, and that included looking at schedule, field assessments, uh, going out and seeing, you know, the, the pictures that you've seen were active out in the, uh, in the, uh, in the field. And we advise uh, RTG in May that there's a high probability that the RSA date could occur as late as Q4 2018. Now the second bullet on this slide is very important. RTG did not agree with that statement. And the PA does not oblige them to move or to change their work schedule. 
So no matter how many times we said to them, we have concerns and we fundamentally think that you will not achieve May 24th, the PA, we can't selectively say, let's change your date. It's up to them. They own that date. That is their, con their contract, as you're going to see in terms of the cost and so forth. That's up to them to manage that. So they continue to issue work schedules that shows an, an RSA date of May 24th. And again, we're being proactive. I was not going to sit around and wait for November and see what we we're going to get for them. So uh, we issue a failure to maintain schedule notice saying we don't believe you're going to make it and we believe your schedule is at risk, so give us your recovery plan. How are you going to make up the time and the, the resources, which is feasible, and they're totally entitled to that, how are you going to get to May 24th? They uh, issue a delay event to us, uh, citing some issues with sealing materials and the uh, enclosures for the fare control. And we immediately reject the delay notice, event notices. That's that key word that I was talking about because we believe there's no basis for that. Um, we again are proactive and we order the independent assessment team to reassemble and do another follow-up prior to, achieve, uh, to arriving to November. And again, the, uh, we're not comfortable with the May 24th RSA date. We don't believe it's achievable. And RTG then in November issues us that conditional notice, which we immediately reject. And we tell them that's not acceptable. They need to give us a new RSA date, to which they then submit a revised schedule and says, they say, we think we can make August 14th. So that's the first of the shift. We reject that schedule and we tell them that in, uh, we need more information, we need a level of detail that we can do a detailed assessment and so we assemble in January and this is the first time that they provide us with the level of details that we needed to understand what they could achieve and how they were going to achieve it and that joint schedule review, this is with them at the table, um, we come to a conclusion that there's a low of them making that August 14th date. That subsequently leads to February 5th, us receiving a notice saying that their new RSA date is November 2nd, and that puts us where we are today in terms of the, uh, the comments that the city manager just made in terms of negotiating some of the contractual issues with RTG. Now, I'm going to enter into the, the questions that have been raised and some of the issues. So I want to start off with liquidated damages, LDs, which are referenced in the project agreements, they apply every time that an RSA date is issued by RTG and they fail to achieve it. Um, they do not apply to when there's a valid delay event as defined in Section 40 of the PA agreement. So there are circumstances, but they don't apply under what's defined in Section 40. The $1 million in liquidated damages is going to be applied if the November 2nd is missed by RTG. And, uh, some councillors have asked, so what happens after that if that were to occur? Uh, RTG provides a new RSA date and subsequently misses that, the LDs apply again. And there's no limit to the number of times that can occur between November 2nd uh, and what's now called the long stop date. That's a defined time contract. That's May 24th, 2019. That's a year after that initial date. That's when we step in and we can do a bunch of things and take it over. Uh, and it's important that you understand that, that, that we are again covered in that regard. Uh, LDs are not a penalty. Uh, the estimate of the damages the city could incur if they miss that RSA within that 180 day window and penalties aren't permitted under Canadian law. Now with respect to delay claims and events, there's nothing really unique in this context here. Similar contracts of this nature, construction contracts, have the same provisions that we're dealing with. Uh, for delay claims, advance, and so forth. And it's important to note that second bullet. Regardless of the delay uh, in the RSA date, RTG always retains the right and the ability to submit delay claims and events. It doesn't mean we need to agree with them, but they have that right. And uh, also, uh, the PA does have provisions that, uh, if they're exercised, uh, could compensate RTG in the event of a major delay or event claim if, if they meet the test within the PA. Now, uh, the city, with respect to the sinkhole, this is important. 
Our opinion has been and continues to be the sinkhole did not constitute a delay event under Section 48A. It doesn't meet that test. And RTG did submit a relief, there's that word again, the relief event notice for the sinkhole and the corresponding delay event notice. Um, and in our opinion, they are not entitled to a relief event on the grounds that the sinkhole was a result of their acts and omissions. That is our position and will continue to be our position. Under the PA, we both have a duty to mitigate the effects of events upon their occurrence. And conversely, RTG also is obligated to use what's called commercially reasonable efforts to reduce or eliminate the effects of, of, of the sinkhole. As you know, RTG did respond immediately following the sinkhole. They've acknowledged, you know, they publicly acknowledged that the sinkhole had a significant impact on their project. And they also believe that they're delayed by other factors, which I mentioned early on, the, uh, the ceiling material and the weather protection for the fare control equipment. We've rejected those claims, and uh, they're a matter of dispute uh, between both parties. And the last bullet is also very important in that uh, if there's any further disputes, we can refer to the independent certifier, uh, arbitration, dissolution, so forth. It's all outlined in the project agreement. Now this next slide speaks to the costs and the, uh, the revenues. I'm gonna start off with the expenses. We've itemized all the costs. Uh, this is the major buckets of uh, costs. There's the detours, the bus operations, our ready for rail campaign, our traffic management, our project office costs, property costs, and lost revenues, uh, the fare bump, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Accounts are in line with what we reported to council previously. And the detailed breakdown forms part of our negotiations with RTG, and we recommend that they remain confidential at this time to protect our negotiations position. With respect to costs, uh, there was an inquiry about what is the, uh, the potential impact on the uh, fare bump, uh, the ridership bump, and I asked Mr. Scrimger to calculate this, and in his usual fashion, he's right down to the decimal point. I'm going to tell you it's about $1.6 million is the, uh, the potential impact, which is all part of the strategy uh, that we're using in terms of RTG that we, we, want, we need to recover those costs. So it's approximately $1.6 million is the impact. And uh, again, the question was very specific about that, so it's there in terms of any further detail. So in terms of negotiation, uh, how are we negotiating with the RTG? It is a negotiation. We're using the monthly service payments that you've heard about in the past. They're, they're going to be gone. Uh, we're going to ensure the full application. This is the third bullet in the slide of what's called the pain chair for Mobility Matters. I don't know if you remember this, but in that award-winning P3, there is a uh, significant cost for detours and for traffic disruptions that RTG needs to pay. That will continue to be in, in, uh, fully invoked during the, uh, the adjusted schedule period and it's in the millions of dollars. Uh, we're going to ensure that all the uh, project agreement provisions are applied and to protect the city, in the worst case scenario, there's a dispute resolution provision where we can pursue our costs, uh, we can go to arbitration, and uh, at the extreme end, we can go to litigation also if we need to. It uh, continues to be our position, we can't say this enough, that RTG is going to be covering all incremental costs and we're going to use the PA, including the payment schedule and the term of the maintenance contract as leverage to seek reimbursement from RTC, RTG. Now with respect to the specific provisions, um, there are milestone payments uh, that are in line with the May 24th RSA date, uh, and counselors have asked how much money is left on the table. There's hundreds of millions of dollars left on the table, significant amounts. There is one milestone payment left, and then there's two other critical payments. They need to achieve substantial completion, and they need to achieve the RSA date. The milestone payment is made once the work defined in that milestone certificate is completed, and payments for both the RSA and substantial completion are very prescriptive, and they need to go through all the testing, commissioning, safety certification, and so forth. And again, I'll emphasize it's hundreds of millions of dollars that's on the table in terms of uh, what's there. Uh, we were asked who controls the cash flow. The city controls the cash flow for the remainder of the project. Uh, we would only consider a modification to payments if it's in the best interest of what we were talking about in terms of protecting the taxpayer and uh, protecting uh, the city as a whole. 
Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but they only re receive 80% of the cost of the works. And that's an important piece. This is the financial incentive. This is the skin in the game part that they have. They have $300 million of their money on the table at all time, and that gets paid back to them over the 30-year concession period. So again, when we talked about in the past about the incentives for RTG, it's in the millions of dollars. Um, and um, the do any deviation rests is with the city manager, and uh, we would report that to Fedco. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris, and then he's gonna flip it back at the end. Before he dives into this, I wanna, I wanna leave a key point on lessons learned. Uh, we have a very good P3 agreement on state. It's award-winning, it's been recognized in the industry. There was no gaps, there was nothing wrong. What we did as a good, uh, a good organization is we said, how do we even improve that? So I don't wanna leave you with the impression that there was any gaps or holes we needed to fill. This is just continuous improvement. So over to Chris. Um, Chair, uh, as Mr. Banconi mentioned, it continues to be a priority for senior staff and the O-Train Planning Office to ensure that the ongoing lessons learned from the Confederation Line project implementation are successfully transferred into the planning and procurement of the Stage 2 LRT project. L'équipe de gestion avec notre équipe de planification de l'O-Train travaillons ensemble afin de s'assurer que les leçons tirées à notre expérience sur la ligne de Confederation inform la planification et l'approvisionnement de projet de l'étape 2. To that end, our office commissioned a lesson learned report by Deloitte to guide our early efforts. This was supplemented by a detailed interdepartmental lessons learned exercise, which was led by our stage two owner's engineering team. And in addition, O-Train construction and planning offices were both placed under the leadership of the general manager for transportation services, who has ensured that a departmental focus on transferring lessons to the stage two office in time occurs. These studies and reviews resulted in some key findings as they relate to contractor performance and schedule completion. The most significant of these findings, as Mr. Banconi mentioned, uh, is the procurement model is working well. That said, we determined that the liquidation, liquidated damages regime should be enhanced to increase recoveries for delay and provide greater, greater clarity in terms of indemnifying the city for any direct losses resulting from a delay event. The review also determined that Mobility Matters, as was mentioned previously, is working well, as well as both short and long-term financing arrangements remain powerful motivators for contractors to meet their construction schedule. Next slide. Mobility Matters places a value for lane closures depending on traffic volumes. Contractors use these values and estimates to estimate a total cost of lane closures at bid submission and any increase on the quantity or length of these closures during con the construction period results in a corresponding deduction from the contractor and substantial completion. That's the gain share, pain share regime that Mr. Manconi mentioned previously. This ensures that the city is compensated for the impact to traffic and the costs of continuing to run bus detours. This is working well and has been reintroduced to the stage two project agreement, as I mentioned. Finally, both stage one and other AFP projects across the province have confirmed that the long and short term financing arrangements remain the most effective ma motivator for overall contractor performance. This is because the contractor repays monies loaned to them in accordance with the project agreement's construction schedule. If construction is delayed, the lender is still required to receive these scheduled repayments. This drives speedy schedule recovery because if construction is late, the proponents must make these repayments, both interest and principal, while they are not getting paid for construction completion. And so, just like a credit card repayment, if you're late with any repayment, it costs you more than making your payments on time. Late lender repayments result in increased interest costs that were not anticipated or accounted for in the contractor's business model. This can significantly erode any potential project profits. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Mr. Manconi. Thanks, Chris. So in summary, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee, uh, the November 24th uh, notice from RTG, as you know, was not clear. It left a bunch of uncertainty for the city. Uh, the December 7th schedule we received from them did not provide clarity on the RSA date. We did not have the evidence to, to see how they were going to get to May 24th. We, rejected, we have rejected their delay event claims. 
We have met with uh, RTG many, many times with the goal of securing a schedule that has reasonable certainty of success. And numerous discussions uh, occurred between the parties that led to the uh, February 5th uh, date confirming revenue service availability uh, will be achieved by RTG on November 2nd. All the claims remain in discussion. And the next steps are we continue with our cost recovery from RTG in accordance with the PA. We're monitoring RTG's schedule and their continued adherence to November 2nd. We may also seek to pursue or preserve our rights and negotiation positions, which can involve dispute resolution and claims. We're going to provide you with your monthly uh, reports to FEDCO, and we are committed to achieving an outcome that provides a schedule certainty, delivers a world-class system to the highest standard of safety and quality at no additional cost to the taxpayer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That concludes the presentation. Great. Well, thank you uh, very much. It's a very uh, thorough presentation. Uh, comments from uh, members of committee? Councillor Nussbaum? Maybe if you, the delegation seat over there. One of the things, just before Councillor Nussbaum uh, takes the seat, I was asking the Treasurer her comment with respect to the, uh, the provisions we have to ensure that taxpayers remain whole, and she said, we have all the carrots and the sticks. So I guess uh, carrot sticks in some ways, uh, and that was uh, helpful uh, to ensure our taxpayers that obviously uh, any delay that's the responsibility of RTG is uh, going to be funded by RTG. Uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor uh, Nussbaum. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much for the presentation from staff. Just a couple of follow-up questions, and I presume we'll be able to get a copy of that, uh, the deck, which I'll go through in greater detail later, but just um, some initial questions. Um, so on the share drive, Councillor. Sorry? The presentation's on the share drive. Excellent. Thank you. Um, first, I think it was on page 41 of the presentation, if you can flip back to that. Um, at some point there was mention of the, of the ability of RTG to claim costs against the city for the fact that the revenue service availability date has been pushed back and I guess that's, if I understood, contingent on a successful decision that there have been delay events, but under what conditions would RTG successfully uh, seek and receive payments for the delay event? What's, what are the key factors or conditions that would determine whether the city would have to pay RTG for the delay in the project uh, the revenue service availability day. I'm going to ask legal to, to give you the, uh, the broad construct of that. Uh, the circumstances in which RTG uh, could seek uh, and obtain either cost uh, relief um, or uh, schedule really fund as a delay event, a compensation event, a relief event, or those which are set out in the agreement. Each one of those categories has specific items uh, by which either RTG or in the case of relief events, uh, RTG or the city um, can make uh, a claim for whether it's cost or schedule recovery uh, as appropriate. Um, a number of those events uh, go on to say things like you cannot make a claim uh, in the event that the event resulted from your act or omissions. Uh, so there are those sorts of limitations. So, uh, Council, you're correct when you say that in order to advance that claim and be successful, uh, you have to meet the requirements of the, uh, of the particular provision that you're, you're trying to access. So I, I believe that's what was intended by that uh, bullet on the slide. Okay, and just to be clear, so RTG has indicated that they will be seeking a decision through a dispute resolution that a delay event has occurred, and as a result, costs that they've had to incur as a result of that, they'll be seeking recovery for, for those? Have they indicated that? Um, I'm going to be cautious about responding. I'm going to look to Mr. O'Connor because I think we're entering into that uh, sphere of negotiations and... Uh, uh, we're in a public forum, so I think we're going to tip our hand here in terms of some of the strategies. So I default to the city manager, or Rick, uh, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, thank you, John. Mr. Mayor, I, th I think the simple answer is um, they have identified, RTG has identified that they have a, a claim, so to speak. It hasn't progressed to the formal process under the, uh, under the project agreement as of this point in time. Um, and as uh, Mr. Manconi said, there are negotiations currently going on which one would assume this will be part of those negotiations to see if we can wrap up both sides, all of our claims, all of our issues at once. 
Okay, thank you. Um, my next question relates to um, the payment schedule. I don't know, maybe it was up on page. Uh, I don't know where you where, where that was. Um, just to understand how the remaining payment schedule works. Um, at one stage, I think Mr. Mahoney, you said there was uh, one milestone payment and two critical project payments. Is that, do, do I have that right? Correct, there's one milestone, substantial completion, and then revenue service availability. Okay, and then so above and beyond those three payments, there are discretionary payments. Is that what you were referring to, that the city could choose to pay discretion payments earlier than they do need to under the project agreement? No, the only other things that are there would be uh, there's a variations list, which during the project there's been a bunch of uh, both from the city side and the con contractor side changes and things, uh, um, uh, issues that are in dispute and so forth. So there's a list of those. But uh, no, there's no other discretionary uh, payments that we would. Uh, I guess I'm looking at that line. The city would only consider early payment, so there is the discretion to provide those payments early. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. If uh, if in the negotiations there's a benefit to the city to do a global offer that looks at how we structure those three payments, uh, the city manager has the authority to do that. Um, and maybe this is a question for Ms. Uh, Simulik, but. What is the cost, I mean, in terms of an early payment, is that money that uh, we see debt issuance or is that money sitting in account somewhere and earning interest? What are, what are the ways in which when we make large payments, where, where are those coming from? Uh, so the city has um, a fairly significant amount of liquidity. So we hold roughly uh, by May or June, uh, is sort of the peak, we'll have about 1.6 billion in cash. So that's what we would be using to, uh, to make those payments. But uh, don't forget some of those payments, we were already planning to pay those out in May as per the original contract. So we're actually going to be now making them later than we had planned. So that's actually of benefit to the city. Right, and I guess what I was just contemplating as I heard that is, um, is it not possible that, that the city could, could gain an advantage by uh, withholding those payments through the fact that it's gaining interest on that capital, um, that if it were to give it to them earlier, it wouldn't get the benefit of uh, getting the interest on that capital, and if it held off and, uh, and gave it over a bit later, it would presumably benefit from having um, interest gained in that delta period. Again, I think we're verging here on to mediation strategy. And so I would caution about any discussion about this in the public forum. Um, my third question uh, was just back to um, a little bit the timeline. I think it was earlier on in the deck. Um, and Mr. Mancona, you mentioned uh, that in August 2017, can you explain that a little bit more? There was a notice of concern. I just saw the French version in Avita something. Uh, I don't know what it was in English, but uh, a notice that there was concern that RTG would not meet the revenue service availability date. Could you just expand on that, please? Uh, certainly. Uh, we, um, we did our verbal notice to them in terms of we saw the slippage that uh, I referenced early on in, uh, in this bullet on slide 32, third bullet down. And when you go through the timeline on, in August 2017, we uh, issue a formal notice saying, uh, we don't believe you're maintaining your schedule to May 24th. So uh, the key part to that is give us the recovery plan. Tell us how you're going to get to, to May 24th. Right. Okay, great. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Let's get this ultimate question. Councillor Aguilar, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not uh, sure if there's anybody at the table that can answer this. Uh, or, or it, it has to do with our new appointment of uh, our safety audit. And so I'm wondering if you perhaps could come to the microphone. I think uh, you might be putting uh, this individual in a bit of an awkward position. He just started today. The city, uh, <laughs> city clerk has a comment. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, uh, with respect, uh, Mr. Borata is here to do his, uh, some of his orientation and meet some people, um, but he is not the uh, safety person for the construction part of this project. He is developing your regulations, your bylaws, your protocols and procedures with regards to the regulatory regime that will be coming. So with the greatest respect to Mr. Brad, I don't think he can add anything to this conversation. No, that's fair enough. And uh, I was trying to take advantage of the fact that he was in the room. So uh, maybe we can talk offline. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Aguilar. Okay, thank you very much. Very thorough presentation, appreciate it. Um, uh, our next item where there's a presentation is the Department, Direction Générale des Services, uh, review, Reserves Review, Revue des Reserves. Uh, Isabel Jasmine, Deputy Treasurer, uh, will take the, the floor. And uh, this is a, a very interesting presentation uh, that um, helps to streamline our many different reserve funds. And I think it also indicates that we have very healthy reserves and one of the reasons why we continue to maintain a AAA credit rating from Moody's. So I believe there's a presentation, and uh, Ms. Jasmine, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, thank you very much. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so yes, we've, uh, the finance team has been working for the past year on this. It's been on our work plan to look at the reserves, um, the structure of the reserves, and the amount that we maintain in our reserves. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, we keep reserves to provide liquidity, financial stability, and operational flexibility. Uh, we also needed to maintain our high credit ratings. So the city does hold some credit ratings from Moody's and S&P. Um, we currently have reserve targets, but um, they're brief. They, they are found in various documents. We don't have a consolidated policy reserves. Um, fiscal framework talks about 1% of operating costs being made tax stabilization. LRFP1 talks about a $50 million target for tax-supported reserves. The LRFP talks about uh, one year's debt servicing for water and rate. Um, there's no target balance established for all other reserves. So what we were looking at is having a much more robust approach um, in terms of determining what should be the minimum and also the maximum reserves and balances. So those are the two issues that we looked at. We looked at the reserve structure. We currently have 33 different reserves to manage. Um, and what we were looking at is we were using more of a portfolio approach. Uh, when you have investments managed with investment portfolio, you're managing your risk by having different levels of risk managed as a whole. And so it's looking at consolidating reserves so that you're actually better managing the risk associated with those reserves. Uh, also looking at the reserve balance. How much is enough? We looked at the minimum and maximum level risk-based approach. We did a full uh, risk analysis on some of the key reserves where there was a correlation between the risks associated and the costs of those um, um, expenditures. So the reserve structure, I uh, will start with there. The way we looked at um, how we should be restructuring reserves going forward is uh, we need to attribute um, a, a separate reserve if the source of funds is different and the use of funds is different. And uh, for example, there's different sources of revenue for example, citywide, transit tax, lease tax. We don't want to commingle uh, those reserves. We want to keep them separate and report on them separately and manage them separately depending on what the purpose of those um, sources of funds are for. We also want to differentiate based on the use of the funds. So being very clear about what's an operating reserve and what's a capital reserve, because the uses are very different. Uh, the uh, operating reserve on an annual expenditure basis, it mitigates fluctuations in operating costs and revenues. It covers operating deficits. Uh, it covers one-time and short-term funding for emergency or unexpected events, and also accumulates funds for future contingent liabilities. So these have an annual a perspective. The capital um, reserves would be more for uh, working capital for approved capital expenditures uh, and it would be invested in earns interest until it's required for use. So in terms of the reserve structure, we've, uh, we're recommending a consolidation of several of the reserves. I'm only going to focus on the significant changes. Uh, for the tax stabilization, we are recommending combining tax stabilization with winter, childcare, uh, self-insurance, and election. 
Um, and in the new minimum balance that we're um, associating with tax stabilization includes all of these, a minimum balance for each. So we're just basically consolidating. We're not losing sight of what's included in that tax stabilization reserve. Uh, we are creating. A, we are also recommending transit operating reserve, um, keeping it uh, separate from the capital reserve. Right now, there's one reserve for transit. This one would help to um, um, manage fluctuations, uh, year expenditures, and revenue. The next two were just uh, reserves that we pr uh, we reported on our financial statements that we're now going to include as part of the budget. Now the capital reserves. So the, the previous page just talked about operating. We're um, in capital reserves. We would uh, have a citywide capital reserve that's dead capital. In past uh, years, we've used citywide to help to cover operating deficits. Uh, now um, we're saying it needs to be uh, maintained specifically for capital, and we're combining the environment reserve into that uh, reserve. Um, fleet, we're combining all the fleet reserves into one, and housing, we had two um, housing reserves, but we always reported them as one in the past. Um, it was the social housing and affordable housing reserves. No significant changes in the other areas. And then there's a category for combined and operating, and those are areas where there's specific line of service, where uh, you actually don't want to commingle across service lines. So water, wastewater, and storm would have their own separate reserves, same with solid waste. And then parking reserve, we're combining the cash and move parking, which was, uh, we stopped collecting in that in 2013, so we're combining with the overall parking reserve and no change in the rest. And so this gives you the reserve balance. So the disposition report came out. Uh, the citizens were um, uh, recommended, recommended uh, settling to specific reserves. And this is the overall balances. So if we combined the, the reserves that we talked about for tax stabilization, for example, we end up with a balance of 23.6 million. Now that does not include the child care reserve, which has, which has 12.4 million, uh, and, but that's committed by 2020. So we did not include that in the balance. But Money is set aside and recognized. And, and then it shows all the other. So in terms of total discretionary reserves, we have 329.2 million. This sh just shows our trend in reserve balances year over year. It's been increasing. Now talk about the balances. Uh, so for the key ones, we uh, went through the next identifying what is the minimum and maximum balance we should keep in each. Um, each of these was based either on a 10-year budget trend or for winter maintenance, for example, we looked at actual, the five-year average, and then uh, maintain one and a half to two months of reserves for that, um, and then the budget amount for elections. So the total minimum uh, in, tax, to in tax stabilization we're recommending is 34.8 and a maximum of 1.5. Transit operating, it's based on budget trends, employee benefits uh, based on a percentage, best practice of what you should maintain as a percentage of the future benefit liability. And then the citywide capital, we've established a minimum to compensate for interest that would come from the endowment fund and sale of surplus land, which helps to uh, fund capital expenditures. So the recommended target balances are in these areas. Um, all the other reserves would be, uh, um, uh, the amount maintained would be based on long range financial plans or other plans. These are the ones where we actually want to establish a minimum and a maximum. The tax stabilization reserve is currently at 23.6. That's the one with the uh, a gap that we need to uh, address. And we're recommending that we address that tar by address target minimum by 2020. Um, and then uh, the others uh, are on track. So the recommendations are to prove a new reserve management policy that uses a portfolio-based structure, uh, establish minimum and maximum targets for the operating reserves in the citywide capital, and increase the, tax, the balance in the tax stabilization reserve from 23.6 million to minimum of 3.8 by 2020. And that would be um, uh, inc uh, inc increased by or budgeted contributions if, if we didn't achieve those surpluses. That's it, thank you. Great, thank you uh, very much. And I know a lot of work went into this particular uh, initiative, so we appreciate all of those efforts. Um, are there any questions, Eli, Councillor Eli Elshantiri? Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to staff for meeting with all committee members and uh, share that presentation with them. My question on, uh, on slide seven, when we talk about employee benefit uh, reserve, I have asked you, uh, to look at it from uh, WSIB, you 
do we do we engage with WSIB on a premier or we just pay them for uh, basically processing our claim? Like, do we have a premier with the WSIB or we just pay them per claim and then we compensate the, the employee? We uh, pay them a premium. We, in fact, reimburse the costs for the employees mark up for WSIB, their administration cost on processing those claims. So uh, it's not a, the, the future, so it's, it's within the budget every year. The yes. WSIB, as you know, because you've been dealing with the changes in the presumptive cancers and the impact that's had on the, on the budget. So we have the money in the, res, uh, in the budget that we think we're going to need to spend in a year. The long-term liability, though, is the actuaries come in and say, if you, the city ceased to exist tomorrow, all these WSIB claimants still have an ongoing, we have an obligation to pay them. They, they value that and they come up with the amount that we put on the financial statements as the long-term liability for WSIB. And if I ask you a question, I'm not sure if you know the answer because I had asked before uh, to, uh, so when, when it comes to uh, sick leave and accommodation in, in our organization, do we have the percentage in comparison with other city of our size? I believe we've asked HR for that data in the past, and I thought we had circulated it, but if we have, we'll, we'll get that and circulate that. If you don't mind, I would, I would really problem. like to have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. point, Councillor. Thank you. Councillor Chernyshenko, please. Uh, really just a comment, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, you've condensed a lot of information into quite a short presentation this morning, and I think done a fairly effective job of, uh, of, of making it understandable as, as one of many non-accountants uh, on council. Um, we do need to be walked through some of this information, uh, and I want to thank you for taking the time. I know you made a the special point of visiting uh, offices of any councillors who, who wanted a, a more detailed briefing, and at that point, um, I had the opportunity to understand it uh, much better, and hence, I really don't have any questions at this point. It, it all seems to, to make good sense, the, uh, the cluster. Uh, um, the portfolio approach, uh, as well as um, your plan to bring us to at least the minimum um, reserve uh, figure by 2020. So thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Wilkinson, please. Thank you for this presentation. I think it's useful to see the overview and the, and the le levels. That, do these levels include the amount of the surplus from last year already distributed as you have in the next report? Uh, yes, they do. Yeah. Well, in, in the, at the budget time, we had moved $10 million out of the anticipated surplus into operating. I didn't see that in the report about putting it, is that in that 25 million or is it separate? No, you're, what you're dealing with is a, the balance is at 31st, 2017. So your decision to take 10 million out will be affected in 2018 as part of the 2018 budget. So the balance we had in citywide was 23.8. 23.8, so the 10 million will come out of that 23.8. All right, unless we have another survey, look it up. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think a large, large part of that surplus came because we had a very good in the Community Lands Corporation that I, I chair, which we have to do in secret so people don't see the deals that are put together. But we are working on some for this year, but I must to tell you that I don't think it's going to be as much as last year. Uh, there's only so much land that we can dispose of, and the prices will vary depending on location, as you know. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hubley, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I want to thank the Treasurer and her staff for this report of the reserves. Uh, in the past, usually uh, I ask questions every year about the reserves, and this is the first time to get to see uh, the whole picture of it. And I think, uh, Mr. Mayor, kudos to, to you uh, for your leadership on this, because uh, I see a big difference, as everybody can now see this uh, graph that uh, it was part of the report that uh, since the class of 2010, as we call ourselves, came in. Uh, the reserves were quite low before that, and I uh, believe we've doubled the amount that's in the reserves now, so that's, uh, that's good news for taxpayers of Ottawa, and so I, I thank you and your staff for that, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor. So uh, on the report, carried. Uh, I just uh, would like to remind members of Council, I think you've seen, uh, I sent a, a, a note around this morning with respect to the City's decision to appeal uh, the 
uh, Canadian Transportation Agency decision on the Prince of Wales Bridge, as well as writing to the Minister of Transportation uh, to seek a uh, cabinet review of the decision as well. I think this is the, the right uh, decision to make, and I appreciate the, uh, um, the work done by the City Clerk's Office to uh, defend the City's position. So, thank you. Uh, are there any notices of motion for the subsequent meeting? Is there any other avis de motion? Uh, inquiries, any written inquiries? Uh, other business and adjournment. Carried? Carried. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned.